playbook is trying to capitalize on some of the clunkier green decks where the removal spell start at three or four mana and God's willing and to a lesser degree feet of resistance very efficient against those kind of cards. And this is a deck that we thought we would see quite a bit of this particular weekend in Obzon Aggro. It is very, very powerful. It's very low to the ground and a lot of the cards, you know, they're good early and they're good late. That's what makes this deck pretty good. Fleece main line, good early, good late. Same thing can be said for Rakshasa Death Dealer and Anna Fence of the Foremost. You throw in some Siege Rhinos and some Wingmate Rocks, some removal spells. It's a pretty straightforward deck and it's a pretty good deck as here is a Rakshasa Death Dealer. And I think part of a, a reason that this is coming to the forefront right now is Anafenza's exiling text box is live for the first time really across standard. Whip of Erebus strategies have become really, really popular, and Anafenza is great against those on top of being a 3-mana 4-4 with additional upside. So that's starting things off with a Tranquil Cove. He'll follow it up with a favorite Hoplite, plays a Flood of Strand as well, and we'll pass the turn back. Number 6 on our Season 1 leaderboard here for 2015, looking to climb up the standings, catch Kevin Jones, and work his way back to the Players' Championship. The Death Dealer is going to come into the red zone. It'll deal two points of damage. Looks like no pumps here from Tillman. So the set's going to go down to 19. Land number three is going to come into play tapped here for Eric and Temple of Malady. Top card here for the Scry action. We'll see where it's going to go in just a moment as Tillman does consult his hand. Eric's deck with a variety of cheap removal, most notably four copies of Bioplate. A little tough on the mana base, but Eric at the ready already with double black. Looks like that top card is going to stay on top and a passing of the turn. We're going to head back with Set's way. And looks like the set is going to sacrifice his Flood Strand on his upkeep, a legacy-esque play there. Well, it's also relevant in that spot because if Joe does it at the end of the turn, he has no mana available. Eric can respond to the cracking of the Flooded Strand. So Joe wants to untap and have the Tranquil Cove at the ready. So in case Eric goes for a removal spell, he has God's Willing, or at least has the ability to represent God's Willing. I have him the draw here for Lissette. Does have a copy of Feet of Resistance in his hand, but the builds of Heroic are different among the players that we do see play it. We saw Stephen Mann's build a little bit earlier today, much different than what Joe is playing here. See Bob White's going to target favorite Hoplite. And this is not bad for Joe because his hand is glutted with the protection effects right now, so I think he would much prefer to do Cast of Feet of Resistance this turn, be able to pass with the white mana up, and be able to use a God's Willing rather than just pass the turn back with all of his mana up. So a uh, very good exchange for Joe. There is a planes and a passing of the turn. Damage dealt there by the favorite hop like Feet of Resistance doing a nice job of countering the Bio Blight. See how Tillman wants to follow up here. He's at 15. Has the Death Dealer out there. Three lands in play as well. See if perhaps a fourth land as Siege Rhino will come to the party here. But this is not really the spot you want to be in with Obzon Aggro here. It's hard to damage race because the blue-white, the white-blue hero deck is so good at doing that, and using removal spells is really dangerous when they can take away your entire turn with something like God's Willing. There is a temple. Top card becomes the bottom one. And we will see what the follow-up will be here in just a moment. You have to imagine Tillman has some sort of spell to play. Be it removal, be it discard, or heck, just another creature. But how you seek your spells against a rogue is always pretty difficult. Also, this deck deals a lot of damage to itself. Yeah, that's part of the consequence of trying to play this aggressive deck where you're trying to cast Fleece Main Lion and Bile Blight early on in the game. You have to play with a lot of lands that deal damage to you. I made phase Oz on Charm will be countered by God's Willing. Lissette will scry. Top card's going to stay on top. We're going to head back Lissette's way. Island will be played. An attack here for four damage. Tillman's going to go down to ten. Remember, Joe kept his card on top of his deck very, very quickly. So let's see what the follow-up's going to be. It'll be a copy of Seeker of the Way and a passing of the turn. I think he kept a Fine Strike, which is just so efficient here. Joe's got mana to spare, and having a cheap cantrip to trigger Heroic or trigger Prowess, very good for Joe right now. Yeah, perhaps that is better than just a random draw in this situation. Death Dealer's going to come across here for two points of damage. Flooded, excuse me, Windswept Teeth will be sacrificed. Now here's a Wingmate Rock with Raid. If you read Brian Brondewin's article this week about this deck that he's been playing, lost in the finals of a PTQ with it, but did make the top four of the Players' Championship just a few weeks ago in Roanoke, he said, we made rock, don't cut one of these. Play four, it is the best card in the deck. Though, it would not surprise me if Eric didn't get to untap here. He could very easily die. Very easily die. Those protection to effects, God's Willing, Feet of Resistance. You see Joe has a God's Willing in his hand right now. He can get the job done right now if the cards do come together appropriately.
needs a protection from white effect, and then a lot of triggers, and some of those triggers need to probably pump the hoplite as well. Yeah. But not impossible to do. Oh, Joe's going to get in here and attack. Perhaps there's some blocking to be done. I think that blocking would probably be a pretty good idea. Well, I, I don't know if he can say no blocks here. I think he's got he's to do something. Eric knows that if he blocks, it's likely to go really bad for him, but I think saying no blocks is likely to kill him. Flood Strang getting get sacrificed here by Lissette. Searching up a planes. And he will start with a copy of Defiant Strike. So some triggering to be done. Favorite Hoplite's going to get a little bit bigger. Seeker of the Way, of course, will get bigger as well due to prowess. And if I'm not mistaken, Eric might have ran a no blocks here. That may be the case. And if that is true, that is bad news. Is that going to cast even more spells? Now, Secret Way is going to get a little bit bigger. Now, here's God's Willing as well. So it looks like a lot of damage is going to be dealt. And if this was a no blocking situation, that's more than enough. Yeah, again, we don't have a clear picture here on whether or not Eric did anything with the Waymate Rock or the token. Well, it's clear now. Yep. Because Joe Lissette has dealt enough damage to get the job done as Eric Tillman will pick up his permanent. So Joe Lissette with white, blue, heroic, up a game here over Obson Agro in the hands of Eric Tillman. A pretty good draw there for Joe, given what Eric put together for his game. And I think Eric needs to block there no matter what. Because broadly speaking, there's two scenarios. Joe's bluffing or Joe's not. If Joe is not bluffing, blocking for you is great because you get the secret of the way out of the, t out of the way. If Joe is not bluffing, you also need to block because if you don't block, you die. So I think Eric's hand is forced there regardless. But the no block did lead to a death, and so Joe Lissette will, gain, will win, excuse me, game number one here with White Blue Heroic. We turn our attention to the cyborg. We will start with Eric Tillman and his three back to nature, his three glare of heresies, three drought and sorrows, two sore and solemn visitor, and Erebos God of the Day, murderers cut. And then two copies of Elspeth Sun's Champion. I think the removal spell there in Murderous Cut is pretty easy to bring in, but also three copies of Glare of Heresy. Not bad at all. It is not bad. That, that's the removal spell of choice. I, I think that Drown Sorrow is okay in this matchup. I'm not sure if Eric has double black reliably enough on the third turn to be able to really sideboard Drown Sorrow because Drown Sorrow gets very bad beyond turn three. The White Blue Heroic Dex is good at pumping his creatures outside of that range. I think the two copies of Elspeth, very good way to win the game. You can either flood the board with blockers or use the minus power to clean up a board that's gotten flushed with big creatures. What do we see on the other side? A Spectre Ward, which is a target with the uh, Heliod's Pilgrim, the Giant's Presence, the Gubalan Trailblazer, or Delia of Heliod, Moral Obstacy, an Erase, two Treasure Cruises, three Suburban Denials, and a full four copies of Glare of Heresy. I like bringing in the Glare of Heresies here. Siege Rhino is problematic for the deck. You know, Fleece Main Lion, there's just good blockers you can get out of the way. Two copies of Treasure Cruise also, if you're expecting the game to be protracted with a lot of removal, having access to that card is very good as well. Uh, I mentioned Brian Braun doing having the conversation, maybe starting a Glare of Heresy in the main deck of Obs on Aggro, and some players saying, eh, I'm not entirely sure if the metagame is in that place just yet. I, I feel like we're almost there. Well, I think most decks provide targets. The question is whether or not there's more flexible spots you, cards you can be playing in that spot. A lot of people have compared it to playing main deck Gainsay, which I don't think is the best analog because Gainsay can stop blue spells. Very few other cards besides other counter spells can stop spells on the stack. Whereas a lot of things can kill a Siege Rhino that's resolved. It doesn't have to be Glare of Heresy. You could be playing with Utter Ends or Heroes Downfalls or what have you. So yes, there are targets in all decks, but I don't think you necessarily have to go to something as extreme as, as Glare of Heresy. And the Gainsay analogy is not quite correct in my opinion. Okay. Well, these players are going to shuffle up here for game number two, but season number one of the Open Series here in 2015 is underway. We're in Columbus right now, of course, but next weekend we'll head to Philly, D.C. after that, and then Indy as well. It's going to be a lot of fun to start things off. Yeah, the following weekend we're going to be doing our regionals, and again, we've already posted the dates and venues for that, February the 7th, so make sure to be checking that out if you're not qualified for the Pro Tour. Houston for the first time the following weekend, which is a standard Open, L.A. after that. Our first modern Open Series in Baltimore, Grand Prix Miami, which will be standard March 6th through 8th. Make sure to stay tuned to MagicGP.com for more information as we get closer to the event. Dallas, which is standard the following weekend. 
And then the Season 1 Invitational in Richmond, which will have a standard Open Series and standard and Legacy as the main events for the Invitational, March 27th through 29th. Me, you, and Matthias Hunt in the booth. Trust me, this uh, first season will be over before we know it. Uh, given how quickly the seasons went last year and the year overall for 2014, it went by pretty quickly. So that's part of the reason you see the players here this weekend. A Joe Lissette, a Logan Mize, a Stephen Mann, players from Florida and California coming here to do battle. Jim Davis from Long Island. They want to get those points. They do not want to miss a weekend because they want to get as many points as possible to either get an at-large bid or win the Season 1 Points Championship to qualify for the Players' Championship that will be taking place at the end of the year. And I think they're also conscious of the story with Stephen Mann. It looked like he had a hammer lock on an invite for most of season three and season four. And then some crazy stuff happened in Seattle the weekend before, and Stephen Mann was a match away of missing out on the Players' Championship. So I think a lot of players are taking that lesson and trying to get some of the work done early so there's less of a sweat at the end of the year. And keep in mind as well that all of these tournaments that we're running, all of our main events are going to be two-day $20,000 tournaments. So we've got our $20,000 standard open happening right now, but next weekend when we are in Philly for Legacy, that's $20,000 too, and we'll have two 5Ks on Sunday. So a lot of matches to be played, a lot of money to be won, a lot of open series points to be earned to get you one step closer to the Players' Championship. Make a name for yourself and be like Brad Nelson, win $20,000. And for your Legacy enthusiasts out there, these effectively amount to more Legacy Grand Prix for you to play. Normally yes. you only get one in North America a year. There's going to be two in the month of January alone. Yeah. I expect a big turnout next weekend in Philly. I think so too. Very healthy Legacy scene out there. Yep. Baltimore's got a great Legacy scene. New York, the New England area, New Jersey. Uh, I expect that event to be very well attended. I wouldn't be surprised to see Joe there next weekend too. I was surprised to see him here. So given that he's shown that he's willing to travel, perhaps a little trip to Philadelphia. He stays on the East Coast. For a standard main event, I was definitely surprised as well. Yeah. If Joe traveled a lot for a, a Legacy Open, I would not be surprised, but coming out to Columbus shows that he is, again, trying to get the work done early. Flooded Strand will search for planes. This will be a favorite hoplite to start things off here for Lissat Tillman with just a Sansep Citadel to get his game started. We'll move to his second turn. See if he's got a creature to deploy like he did last time, perhaps a Thought Seize, and it will be the discard spell, so we will see Lissat's hand here in just a moment. And information is so valuable against White Blue Heroic because how you se sequence your threats and removal spells depends so much on the specifics of their hand. You do see the hand here for Lucetta Hero of Iroas, a God's Ruling, a favorite hoplite, a copy of Ordeal of Heliod acting as the ore to pump up the jam, along with a Temple of Enlightenment and a Plains. Not the best hand we've ever seen from this deck. No Ordeal of Thassa or Heliod's Pilgrim hanging out. Only one protection spell, but not a terrible hand either. But this is a hand that Thought sees taking away the best card and also arming Eric with the information on how to proceed with the game, this can be a disaster for Joe. I mean, he knows that, you know, Eric's in a position where he knows he can take the God's Willing, strip him of protection effects, take the ordeal and leave him with no enchantments, take the Hero of Iroas and leave him with very few threats. There's a lot of different paths for Eric here, and, and Joe will not know exactly what he needs to play around. Well, there goes the protection spell on God's Willing. That's the one that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. It was such a problem for Tillman in the first game. You have to imagine that influences his decision a little bit. Against these decks that are packing a bunch of three and four mana removal spells like Obzon typically is, God's Willing is the most important card they bring to the table because that's how you have these turns that are so bad for your tempo. Like we saw in game one where Joe's able to advance his board and knock away Eric's entire turn. Eric has to be mindful of those exchanges, prevent them at all costs. Temple of Silence, take a look at the top card the top card. We'll stay on top. We're going to go back with Seth's way. So Seth will draw. He's like another copy of Favorite Hoplite, but he'll serve him with this first one. Puts him down to 17. Let's see if he wants to go with the Temple or just the Plains here. Looks like he's going to go with the Plains and follow up here with the Hero Virus and just pass the turn back over to Tillman. And there's so problems with all these sequences. If Joe plays an enchantment there, he gets picked apart by a piece of spot removal. This sequence exposes him to Drown and Sorrow. If he, un if he just dumps favorite hoplites on the table, Bioblight ruins him. If he does nothing, Eric just casting a creature is problematic. So Joe's got to kind of pick his poison in this spot. Something bad can happen no matter what he does. Yeah. Once our teeth going to get sacrificed, Tillman's going to go on a 16. Time for either Forest or a Plains, and it will be a Forest. And we'll see what Eric wants to cast on this, the third turn of his game. It certainly feels like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, doesn't it? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's tough because there's all sorts of things he can lose to depending on what he sequences. But he doesn't, he's not certain that there's Drenn and Sorrow on Eric's sideboard, so I think that's probably the card that's best, your best serve ignoring. 
because you know about Bioblight and uh, you know there's all sorts of random removal spells floating around the deck, so you can't really just say go. Here's Thoughtseize. So the draw was a favorite hoplite. Eric will record that information to go along with the other favorite hoplite, the ordeal, and the template he knows about, so he'll take care of the ordeal. And now the follow-up here is a Rashasha Death Dealer into passing of the turn. So if you're Joe, you feel pretty good. That turn could have gone a lot worse. I'd say that Joe's hand is great right now, though. Just picked up another land for the turn. So Temple of Enlightenment's going to have to work overtime here. That's the land he's going to play. A little scry action here. Aqueous form is what he is looking at. And that, that can certainly help. Top card becomes the bottom one. I think that if Joe's first order of business here was attacking with both creatures, there's no way Eric Brock blocks the certainly not the hoplite and maybe not the hero of the hero of Iroas either. I like this attack a lot. I love this attack. I think it's hard for Eric to block. I was wondering if Joe was gonna pull the trigger, but well, he's gonna block. And here's the thing. Part of the reason to bluff here is also because Joe's hand is just his favorite hoplites, in the event that Eric blocks, where there's no guarantee of it anyway, what ends up happening is you lose a, fa a favorite hoplite, which is not so bad for you because you want to hedge against Bioblade a little bit anyway. So you just lose that, play another one, and you're still about in the same spot roughly against Bioblade. Yeah, you're okay. And I think a good percentage of the time, you know, a random player put in that board spot will not block in Eric's position. So I like that play from Joe quite a bit. Can't forget that you're also getting some points of damage that you may not get otherwise. Right. It's a bluff, but it's a bluff where even if your opponent calls, it's not the end of the world, which is a good spot to pick. Tim with the fourth mana. Land of War Waste was the land he played, and now he is reaching. But what is he casting is the question, or at least what is he setting up? That is the big question right now. And he's just going to pass the turn back with the Death Dealer on defense. Upkeep, Murderous Cut, going after the Hero of Arroas. And that will be killed. The set will draw. He left Aqueous Form on top of his deck. He needs this one to be good. And he will play it. Trigger the Favorite Hoplite. Thumbs up immediately. That'll trigger Heroic. It's a 2-3. Coming to the red zone here. Unblockable Scry. And this is one of those spots where, yes, there's infinite risk involved with this play, but Joe has no other options. His hand's too bad. He's got to take this risk. We're going back to Tillman. It does make you wonder about the contents of his hand. Is he doing okay against what Lissette has out here? Again, there's a lot that can go wrong for Lissette in this situation. Any removal spell picks him apart. He certainly needs some help. Here's the attack with the Death Dealer. Two damage will come across, so it's going to go down to 17. And now Tillman will follow up with a copy of Anafenza. There's a Temple of Silence. Take a look at the top card. Top card will go to the bottom. Pass the turn back. Lissette is being let off pretty easy here. Yep. Uh, I mean, if, if Eric produces nothing but creatures for the rest of the game, Joe's got a great shot to win. Yes, Eric's clock is reasonably fast, but Joe, especially with access now to Heliod's Pilgrim and a variety of uh, enchantments, may be able to generate an even faster clock. Oh, speaking of enchantments, we might have another one coming in just a moment here. It is a copy of Heliod's Pilgrim. Lissette is going to go searching. The question is, what is he going to find? Because the game has become a pure damage race, I think that Ordeal of Gila would be the nicest one. Now, one of them's already been stripped away from an earlier Thoughtseize. The question is, has he brought in his second copy? Because there's one on the board. I would expect in this matchup that he would want one as a tutor target, but not really want to naturally draw it very often. So not surprising that he, has, he does not have one to go get in this spot. Well, Ordeal of Thoughtseize will be the choice. The second I come across into the red zone here, unblockable, of course, is that favorite hoplite. So now it's time for him to scry. Take a look at the top card. Looks like it was Lagoon Van Trailblazers. That's going to become the bottom card. And two damage will come across. Tillman's going to go down to eight. Lissette trying to hold on. Refuses to, to deploy that other favorite Hoplite. Perhaps trying to bluff a God's Willing here. Though Tillman does know about the favorite Hoplite, perhaps he's forgotten about it. I mean, it seems like a hedge against Bioblade, but 
I feel like it's probably worth casting. It's going to be, you're going to be hard pressed to be Bob Light in this game anyway. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because you know, it's certainly, I think he is trying to hedge around Bob Light a little bit until that favorite hop light becomes a 3 4, which he can do next turn. It could also just be a situation where you're hoping maybe your opponent forgot that they knew that card. Perhaps, yes. Big time attack here for Mana Fenza and the Death Dealer. Yeah, it looks like Lissette is on chump blocking duty already. Because one thing that this Hobbs on Aggro deck can do with this combination of cards is close out a game very quickly. And you may even wonder why Joe is blocking ostensibly the smaller creature here. It's because he's thrilled if Eric spends his mana this way. If he blocks the Death Dealer and then Eric goes, okay, we may rock post combat, Joe's in a ton of trouble. Yeah, it's really bad news. Thoughts he's going to show up here, take care of the ordeal. Tillman's down to five. There's a land pass to turn back. Tillman knows he needs to close this game out. Lissette's looking to close it out. Didn't get a great look at what he drew. Maybe it looks like maybe an ordeal of Heliot, perhaps. Actually, another Heliot's Pilgrim. This is good news for Joe. I mean, any enchantment will put him in a position or any target effect to kill in two turns. Eric can't kill him next turn. So Eric really needs to draw a removal spell, some way to gain life or something. Oh, there's the Pilgrim. And Tillman's out of cards in his hand right now, too. So if you're the set, as it looks like he may search up a copy of Aqueous form, might be time to deploy that other favorite hoplite, too. Might need that one to block. Yeah, the question is, can you beat Bio Blight under any circumstances? I don't know if the favorite hoplite really changes the equation very much. Yeah, I'm not convinced that he can now. But the upshot is he beats a variety of other things. Cre a creature's no good in this spot. A land certainly isn't. Red zone. Scry yet again. God's willing is the top card. It looks like it's going to stay as the top card. Now there is the hoplite and pass the turn back. So let's see what someone's able to draw. He's sitting here at three. Potentially facing lethal next turn. Something like a siege round would be pretty good. I think he's hoping that he draws one of those, and Joe's hoping that he doesn't. Take a draw. A lot of really good draws here. A removal spell's excellent. Soren's excellent. And this was the cost of the, the line of play here. Joe potentially missed out on a point of damage last turn, depending on how things hurt, could have broke. Yep. Which could change the outcome of the game, depending on Eric's draw. Not sure what he drew, but he is organizing some mana, so it feels like a spell. So creatures are no good here, except for Siege Rhino. Yep. And Wingmate Rock's not going to help. Elspeth's no good. What's this two mana spell? It is a copy of Bile Blight. That one's not shabby. That is a very, very good one. That'll take care of both the favorite Hoplites of the Aqueous form. And with the attack here from both creatures, it looks like it forces a block as well. And we know that Joe left God's Willing on top of his deck, mm -hmm. so. What a huge, huge draw there for Eric Tillman. But he wants to make sure he doesn't make a mistake right now. Playing against a great player. Looks like he has quite the advantage. Trigger on Offensa. A set trying to figure out, is there any way that I can take this damage? Itch. Not block at all, but... It's lethal. I mean, the, a pump from a death dealer is exactly 10. Yeah. So. And Joe's got to pack it up. Loses this game to a top deck there from Eric Tillman, and Bile Blight will be headed to a third one here. You can tell Eric Tillman is pretty happy about it. Obzon Aggro and White Blue Heroic going to game three. Yep. I mean, it, that was a pretty harrowing spot there. Bile Blight, definitely the best draw in Eric's deck. Yeah. Timely. Four copies. So... Don't know the exact percentage on drawing one. You just know it was the best draw that you could find. You have to imagine all four copies are in his deck after sideboard. It's just a great card in the matchup. He wins a good percentage of the time for that spot if it's just a regular removal spell. Yeah. But definitely, definitely Bile Blight, the best of the bunch there. Yeah, if it's a card like just Glare of Heresy or Hero's Downfall or, or heck, Obstant Charm might even be okay in that situation too. He's probably going to win. So Bile Blight just being the best of the bunch, it certainly looks the most impactful, and it does get the job done there. And that's why we'll be headed to a third game here between Tillman and Lissette. I was on aggro and White Blue Heroic. Though Lissette will be on the play, though it doesn't look like he's going back to the drawing board at all. Looks happy with his configuration. 
Well, I think Joe commonly, it, it may look like that. I think Joe pretty commonly shuffles his entire sideboard in, but it looks like he's keeping it mostly the same. Appears to be cutting a treasure cruise. Yeah, since he's on the play now, maybe some things change as far as his configuration is concerned. Well, it looks like the 15 are going back into the box, and maybe one's going to come in, one's going to come out. We'll see how he wants to change things up here for game number three in just a moment. But we will take a look at our season two schedule for 2015. Well, we will start in Syracuse with the Dinosaur Barbecue. Yep, a lot of standard coming through in season two here with Syracuse, Providence, Cleveland, and Seattle. As you mentioned, it's a pretty short tilt as we move over to the next page here. We see Dallas, Worcester, which will be Legacy, and then a modern open series with modern and standard as the invitational formats in Columbus, Origins Game Fair, June 5th through 7th with me, you, and Matthias in the booth. Not going to be a very long season, so I imagine we'll probably see a lot of players travel during that season. Though we kind of are all over the place, going to Cleveland and Seattle. Those are definitely different parts of the world, going to Syracuse as well. So I am interested to see exactly how many players are going to travel for what is just seven events during the season. Yeah, I'm optimistic, though, just because, again, the turnout here in Columbus has been great. A lot of our top 16 and top 32 really making an early push. Yeah, no surprise to see that there at all. Columbus always has a fantastic turnout. We've got around 700 players here today. I imagine we'll see quite a few tomorrow for our Legacy Premier IQ and our Modern Premier IQ as well. And excitingly enough, it does not appear as though we will get snowed in. Lucky us. Really exciting. This year already better than last year. Though, you know, as bad as it was being snowed in Indy week one of last year, I'll never forget it. I will say that. Yeah, there's a lot of really bad things that have occurred in my life that I'll never forget. Uh, that's, you know. I don't know if that's a positive or not, but it feels like a positive to me. It's how it works. Yeah. I'll never forget getting snowed in in Indy and going to the Noodles and Company where I was the only person in there with one employee. Why the store wasn't closed down, not entirely sure. Yep. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but we shared some nice conversation. I'm sure they were just thrilled that there was anyone still alive in the city. I remember being yelled at when I walked through the convention center in a part that was roped off mm -hmm. and having to explain that I'm not going outside. <laughs> Why are you yelling at me? Dude, crisis brings out the best and the worst <laughs> in us. A flooded strand to start things off here for the set. Sansep Citadel on Tillman's side. Second, like going to sacrifice that flooded strand. We'll see if it'll be an island or a plains here for Joe. And it will be an island. This white blue heroic deck is probably kind of an annoying strategy for Joe to have to play because it involves a lot of re sleeving with his legacy deck. <laughs> it's flooded strands and his horrendous revised basic lands. So all, unless he has a lot of them, I guess that's possible. But I wouldn't be surprised if he owns eight flooded strands. Sure. Wouldn't surprise me. One for home and one for away? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up games in the basement and then <laughs> when I'm traveling out on the road. Hero of Iroas will be cast. I imagine that the ones that are on the spotlight are the old ones. He probably uses the new ones with the yucky art right. for, his, for his testing. Claire Ferris, you going to take care of that. And Eric, not getting fancy here. Just get this thing off the table while Joe's shields are down. Going to search of a forest with that windswept heat. There's Battlewise Hoplite. Perhaps that's the one that Joe wanted in the first place. Scry is very powerful after all. Joe could have also had a really efficient turn. This, this turn of Hero of Iroas made it into turn number three. Tillman will draw. Two mana. It's a Death Dealer. This is a Temple of Silence. Take a look at the top card. Tillman will take a moment to consult his hand, and it will stay on top as we will head back Lissette's way. Two planes and island along with the battle-wise hoplite here for Joe. So he does have a copy of Ordeal of Thassa in hand. And he will have to pay two mana for that one, of course. Because he does not have a hero of Iros in play. Okay, so it's a battle-wise hoplite. Your hero of Iros yeah. is dead. I think Joe was really hoping for another blue source of mana this turn so we could have fired off both ordeals. So even if Eric had a removal spell, he would have gotten to draw a bunch of cards. Yeah, for sure. As it stands, I think it's bad news if Eric has a removal spell and is willing to pull the trigger. Now, he doesn't know that Joe has no copies of God's Willing, and it's a big risk for Eric to go for it, but 
he may not have an alternative. And that's part of what makes the heroic deck so tough is that they're always going to represent the fact that they have God's Willing or a Johnny's Presence or Feet of Resistance available, and it will contort the way that the opponent plays, whether they actually have one or not. Yeah, but Eric might be in a spot right now where it just doesn't matter. He can't allow this ordeal to go off. He might have to pull the trigger on just hoping that it resolves if he has a removal spell. Because so I think even playing Siege Rhino this turn, if he had it, would mean he falls too far behind and Joe gets to draw a bunch of cards. Yeah, how about a 5-5 five, five, then? Well, here comes the Death Dealer. Just two damage going to be dealt. What's that going to go down to 17? There is land number four, tap four mana, and there is the Rhino. So someone's going to go up to 18. Lissette's going to go down to 14. But Joe's got the biggest creature on the battlefield right now. Four far battle-wise, Hoplite going to turn into a 5-5 five -five after it attacks at the very least. Yeah, Joe's going to get to look at a bunch of cards here. I think he has a second ordeal in his hand, which is an attractive play in this spot. Yeah, that's where he's reaching. And there that is. So you mentioned he gets to look at a bunch of cards. Start here with the Scry, too. Favorite Hoplite? How do you look? Good enough. Time to attack. Trigger. Peel two. Trigger. Peel two more. That's a 7-7 seven, seven Hoplite out there, folks. Even though the Hoplite looks a little anemic that he kept on top of his deck, I think Joe is in the market for both creatures and cheap stuff to follow up this turn with. And that Hoplite fits, fits the build both ways. And Joe will play a play. It's like he may pass the turn back, but he's not ready to do that just yet. No, I'm sure Joe just wants to just dump some stuff out on the table. Just make sure that he deploys his cards as efficiently as possible. There is favorite hoplite now. There is a pass on the turn. We're going to go back to Tillman's way. Tillman will draw. Siege right on Death Dealer out there along four lands. The ability to pump the Death Dealer twice is on the table. Real speaks to the, the potency of this white blue deck where Eric's draw here was not shabby. You know, he's got a turn two glare, a turn three death dealer, and it comes to play tap land, a turn four siege rhino. And unless he can find a removal spell or a sweeper, he's in a lot of trouble. Yeah. I mean, even a removal spell may not be good enough at this point. It's possible Joe has found a God's Willing or a Feet of Resistance in all the cards he's looked at. So oh, here comes the Rhino. Looks like Death Dealer is going to be on blocking duty, or at least try to be. And land number five, and there's Wingmate Rock. So along with the Raid Trigger, we saw Tillman try to do this in the first game to get the job done. He was unsuccessful then. We'll see if he'll be successful now. I mean, this is really hoping against hope here. There's a, uh, an unblockable effect combined with not that many pumps will kill Eric in the spot. What he has going for him right now is that he has a good spread of colors. So Feet of Resistance and God's Willing are going to, it's going to be hard for Joe to kill him that way. And yeah, Aqua's form is the big one. Yes. Back to the ultimate God's Willing in this situation. And with the draw of Defiant Strike and Joe very quickly tapping his mana, this does not look good here for Eric. Aqua's form going to come in, trigger Heroic. Hoplite going to get a little bit bigger. Here's a little scry action. Top card going to the bottom very quickly. Aqua's form will resolve. Uh, Defiant Strike, keep in mind, right now you can look at that as one mana plus two. One okay. for the Rogue Trigger, one for Defiant Strike itself. Yep. And you may be asking, why is Joe just not showing his hand right here? It's because he could still lose to Devouring Light. Sure. So he's looking for a protection effect, even though it's unlikely that Devouring Light's in Eric's deck, it's still a possibility. So Joe not getting sloppy here, trying to see if he can find a protection effect, which I think he has. Yep, and now he, has it, now he has it locked up. Picked up a copy of God's Willing. There's a second Defiant Strike. Is that, that is going to do it. Joe Lissette's going to win this match here over Eric Tillman. Two games to one. White Blue Rook will take care of Abzan Aggro. And for number six on our season one leaderboard here for 2015, he wants to head back to the Players' Championship. That's why he flew out here from California. He's off to a great start. He's six and one. And I, I think Eric played a, a pretty solid match there and had a fortuitous draw there in game two to win that game. But I think that overall, 
his removal speed is just not efficient enough to keep up with Joe's good draws, especially when he's on the draw. And you saw that in game three. It wasn't like.